However, even if speech analysis were solved, the learner still faces the obstacle mentioned in Lawrence and Margolis's third premise, namely that the data that would be needed for choosing among these sets of principles are in many cases not the sort of data that are available to an empiricist learner in the child's situation. When we talk about epistemic situation, we talk about a uh, situation with respect to knowledge. Epistemic means related to knowledge. The reasons for this are various. First, PLD are known to be idiosyncratic and degenerate. So, for instance, children are constantly faced with ungrammatical utterances due to speech errors, false starts, run-on sentences, etc. There is also the absence of relevant negative data in the input received by the child. Positive data is information regarding which possible sentences are, are sentences of the target language. In contrast, negative data constitutes information regarding which possible sentences are not sentences of the language to be acquired. This would include corrections or other forms of feedback from a parent or other figure that tell the child that one of her utterances is ungrammatical. So, for instance, children may hear a question like, is the man who is in the park reading? But they never hear an utterance of, is the man who in the park is reading? Prefixed by an asterisk or some sort of clarification of the ungrammatical status of the sentence. Moreover, in some situations, negative evidence would be crucial for an empiricist learner. Consider this. There are two basic ways in which the child's grammar can differ from the grammar of the environment, which we may call target grammar. In one of these, the target grammar contains a linguistic construction that the child's grammar lacks, so that the child's grammar is a subset of the target grammar. In this case, we say that the child grammar undergenerates. The solution to this predicament is to add construction X to the, to the grammar. And so, in the what data then are needed? Well, it's simply sentences exemplifying construction X on the part of parents or whoever else. So, all that is needed is positive data. But now consider the opposite scenario. Here, the child's grammar has a construction that the target grammar lacks, so that the child's grammar overgenerates, and it's a, it's a superset of the, of the target grammar. The solution to this, then, is to eliminate construction Y from the grammar. But to do this, the child would have to obtain evidence that construction Y is not part of the target language. This means that the child would require negative data. But since this is missing from the linguistic environment, an empiricist learner would be in a bad position to escape this overgeneration situation. Also, whenever correction is offered, it is either irrelevant, ignored, or rejected. Parental correction to children's mistakes is usually focused on the content of the utterance, that is, whether it's true or polite, or its pronunciation, rather than on grammatical form. Grammatical correction, on the other hand, is relatively infrequent and unsystematic. And even where errors are explicitly pointed out or instruction is offered, correction is often rejected by the child. Here is an example of a recorded conversation between MIT philosophy professor Sylvain Bromberger and his two-year-old granddaughter Eliza. Eliza says, me play. And Sylvain says, um, Eliza, sweetheart, say, I play. Me play. No, no, not me. I, okay? Say I. Me. Say I, I, I. I, I, I. Say bye, bye. Bye, bye. Great. Now say I. Me. Okay, now the empiricist learner's predicament. As we said, in order to figure out uh, the correct hypothesis, the empiricist learner can only appeal to general topic-neutral constraints on hypotheses, such as simplicity and the like, and relative evidence. But if what was said earlier is correct, then B is largely unavailable, and A is insufficient for the task of zeroing in on the correct grammar. So. Lawrence and Margolis' fourth premise is that if children were empiricist learners, they wouldn't be able to reliably arrive at the correct grammar for the language. But as we know, children do reliably arrive at the correct grammar for the language. So if we combine four and five, we get their conclusion. Namely, that children are not empiricist learners. And this 
is the conclusion of the standard uh, poverty of stimulus argument as presented by Lorenz and Margolis. Now, if you want to see the argument is in a nutshell, it is this. It is this conditional. It has a, a conditional premise and then uh, an additional premise. The first one says that if children were empiricist learners, then they wouldn't be able to reliably arrive at the correct grammar for the language. But children do reliably arrive at the correct grammar of their language. Therefore, children are not empiricist learners. And the rest of the premises are just um, a way of, of uh, building the case for A and all the examples that we gave. Another way of formulating what is behind the uh, poverty of stimulus argument is what uh, Jackendoff called the paradox of language acquisition. It was Ray Jackendoff is, a, is an American linguist, and he says, here is what makes the child's acquisition of language even more remarkable. Thousands of linguists throughout the world had been trying for decades to figure out the principles behind the grammatical patterns of various languages, the very same grammatical principles that children acquire unconsciously. But any linguist will tell you that we are nowhere near a complete account of the mental grammar for any language. In other words, an entire community of highly trained professionals, bringing to bear years of conscious attention and sharing of information, has been unable to duplicate the feat that every normal child accomplishes by the age of 10 or so, unconsciously and unaided. The contrast is so striking and so fundamental that it deserves a name. I like to call it the paradox of language acquisition. Okay, that's all for this video. Cheers. Bye.